coming back to Jeremy, you're obviously an Orthodox rabbi and you do believe in God. Um, but in a way, I could imagine people, you know, a naturalist, an atheist seizing upon your work and saying, well, look, Jeremy's showing that there's a sort of very naturalistic principle at work here, an organizing principle embedded in the fit, the, the basic physics, if you like. Um, so once again, no need for any, you know, additional explanations like God for, for life or anything like that. How do you, how do you approach that whole question? So that's another one of those ones where it could be a very long discussion if we wanted it to be. Um, I think maybe the first thing to say is just getting back to what you mentioned at the beginning with the, the sort of funny story with the, the Dan Brown novel. I think because the plot of that novel was geared at essentially taking the idea of a physical notion of the origins of life and running with it in the direction of saying science has disproven the, the value or meaning of biblical religion and now what does the world do afterwards? Uh, what that experience, one of the things that it, it did was it kind of goosed me a little bit into thinking about how I would write about uh, some of these ideas if I were going to talk um, to the broader public in, in, in long form uh, and try to teach about them. Because I think I had already been mulling over the idea of writing a book. Uh, and, and then uh, I think what it really reminded me of is that I shouldn't pretend to be naive about what people are going to do with ideas like this. And, and that they'll, there will be a lot of interest in, in saying, oh, so you know, we have yet more proof that God is dead because someone has, has moved the marker forward in a, in a certain kind of uh, line of scientific inquiry. And so I thought then what I want to make sure to do is when I write a book about this, I don't want to pretend that I don't have thoughts about it or I, I don't have other kind of commitments or other, other sources that I want to bring into that discussion because it is a broader one. It's not only the narrow scientific discussion. Uh, so in, in this book uh, that I, I wrote and, and that came out, uh, I guess, in the last quarter of, of, of 2020 that you referred to at the beginning, Every Life is on Fire, I, I tried to, on the one hand, write a book about the physics uh, of lifelike self-organization and, and try to do that sort of straight down the line and talk about it as I would being a physicist trying to explain these concepts uh, in ways that are accessible, uh, maybe to a broader audience. But at the same time, I deliberately interwove it with a parallel set of commentaries on a passage in the Hebrew Bible that I think actually contains a reflection on what living things are as combinations of inanimate materials and, and you know, how lifelike behavior comes out of that. And so I, I wouldn't want to say, oh, look here, you know, if you peer into the Torah in the right way, you can kind of extract scientific conclusions from it. I, I don't think that that's a sensible way of reading the Hebrew Bible. And I also don't think it's a good way of doing science. Um, but it was important to me to try to provide an example of how you can take both ways of contemplating the material basis of life seriously and do so in a harmonious way where maybe the perspective of the biblical commentary almost gives you an opportunity to teach some of the concepts more clearly uh, and at the same time also helps you situate it in a context of a broader discussion and reminds you that science isn't going to give you the answers to some of the questions you might be inclined to ask. Yeah, I, I mean, in that sense, when you see evidence that life could have arisen by some natural process uh, that, you know, we don't have to have, you know, a God who is sort of tinkering with the parts as a miracle, essentially, in order for life to arise, d that doesn't in any way impact your belief that there is a God behind the whole of creation. It, it, what I mean, how do you put those together? Do you just say God is the one who instantiated this kind of a universe in which physical processes will eventually produce living organisms? I guess, again, big long discussion that could follow <laughs> such a question. And I, I don't want to pretend that anything I could say could exhaust uh, even what I might have to say on the subject. But um, I think there are at least two things that one could say in brief. One is that to me, if I think of the use for which the text of the Torah and more generally the Hebrew Bible was created, one has to think about what kind of an activity it's trying to get someone to engage in, right? So I can look at the digits of pi and say, they're true. 
if I am using them for the right purpose, right? If I'm trying to compute the area of a circle, that's going to help me. If I'm trying to use them as a phone book, that's kind of an absurd way to use the digits of pi. It's also absurd to use the Torah as a phone book. And I think sometimes when we get into these confused discussions about science and religion, there are similarly absurd uses that people are taking as the intended use of the text. And then there's sort of confusion about the use of the text that's agreed upon by both parties to that dispute. So they kind of draw a line of scrimmage and agree to misuse the text and, and get confused about it. Or at least, you know, sometimes the most uh, fractious kind of versions of that discussion appear that way to me. I think the way to understand that the goal that the Torah or more generally the Hebrew Bible has is that it's trying to catalyze the mission of a servant of God, right? That it's trying to advocate a way of talking about human experience and say, take the data of experience, take what you perceive in the world and put this interpretive frame on it and let that be a way of guiding your activity. And if you're going to use it for that purpose, this is the language in which it's going to talk about what the world is. This is the language that's going to enable you to navigate that mission or you know, to, to pursue that mission and navigate the world in which it's going to be pursued uh, most effectively. That doesn't mean there aren't other languages with which you could talk about the same world. Um, and, and in fact, we're even told that at the beginning, right? That when, when God says, let there be light and there was light, one of the points there that the speech coming before the light itself is that the light by which we see the world comes from the way we talk about it, right? So we have different ways we can choose to talk about the same world. Even physics and biology fit that description. Um, and we're going to succeed depending on what we're trying to do, uh, depending on whether we match the activity we're undertaking with the language we use to characterize things. So that's a very kind of high level reaction. Mm. And, and I, I, the thing I would just add in brief on top of that is that I also see, particularly within the Jewish tradition and, and the relationship that it has since ancient times sought to have in large part with its texts, uh, that the notion of whether God is there is not so much a fact to be empirically tested, but more like a covenant or a commitment that you choose to become a party to. And so I, I think that it's not a matter of proving or disproving the existence of God, but more saying let me walk the path of someone who has chosen to use this as an interpretive frame for experience and then ask the question, do I find that this is guiding me as I walk that path? You know, do, am I finding it a useful interpretive frame in the same way that assuming that other human beings have conscious intentions and that they're possible partners in communication isn't it actually an interpretive frame I could choose or not choose to impose on my experience. I also can make that choice with respect to seeking a relationship with the creator of the world. Um, and it's not as easy and it's mm. much more complex mm. and, and one mm. needs guidance that I think these traditions uh, seek to try to provide. Um, but that's the opportunity there. 